This is the upgraded version of the Engine Pro from Ingwei, and I've been riding it every day for the past two weeks so I can tell you what I think. At the time of recording this bike comes in at $1450. A pretty penny, but in its price bracket appears to be the most fully featured e-bike I've tested so far. Its power, range, quality of components, and ride quality leave me wondering where they made sacrifices. So let's try to find out. The Engine Pro is a good example of a company listening to its customers and reviewers then making upgrades accordingly. And although some of the features on this bike are not put into practice in the most optimum way, I couldn't find any deal breakers. I'm going to go ahead and get some of the basic specifications out of the way real quick on this bike and that you would expect to see on similar folding fat tire bikes. We have 20 inch diameter, 4 inch wide fat tires, a 750 watt motor, a 48 volt battery with 16 amp hours, a front and rear tail light, quick release handlebars, quick release seat, a folding stem, and a folding frame. As with every e-bike I've tested so far, the quality of the frame itself and its welds looks good and solid. The wheels are magnesium alloy, the rack is bolt-on and removable, then of course we have the generously large front and rear fenders which are good at keeping the mud and water off of you. I'll now go ahead and cover some of the features on this bike that make it really stand out over a lot of the competition before we go into more detail. The Engine Pro sports a thumb throttle, personal preference for me but on e-bikes I like thumb throttles. It also has cruise control that is toggleable but on by default. The heads up display is bright, easy to see in direct sunlight, is colored and has a built-in light sensor which automatically brightens or dims the screen depending on light conditions. This makes it easy to see in direct sunlight but also dims it at night so it's not blinding you. The light sensor on the display also interacts with the front and rear tail light turning them on automatically when it gets dark. This setting is toggleable in the display menu, more on that in a little bit. Front and rear full hydraulic disc brakes which is handy for more than the obvious reason which we'll cover later. The bike has full suspension and the front forks are actual hydraulic forks. As for the rear suspension, I don't know if it's hydraulic. I don't have enough experience with these to tell you one way or the other, but it does its job. The frame houses and protects its fully integrated battery, which can be common on some folding e-bikes, but not all. The gear set on the bike, along with its customizable pedal assist settings, allow us to use every single gear, so nothing's wasted. You guys know I like that. And the gear ratio on the bike itself allows you to give meaningful assistance all the way up to 20 miles an hour without your legs running away. They've even used a chain with some kind of coating on it that makes it really resistant to rust. I've been riding this in almost wet conditions exclusively, and I haven't seen a spot of rust on this chain yet. And here in Louisiana, that's kind of saying something. 
With those being the key features on the bike, we'll go into more detail, cover our neutral thoughts, and our nitpicks. On to our first neutral thought, which some may think should have been a key feature on the bike, and that's its quote-unquote regenerative braking. For reasons which would make this way too long to explain in the video, most geared hub motors don't use regenerative braking, instead they have a built-in clutch which allows it to freewheel and makes it easier to pedal. Ingwe decided to, I guess, basically remove the clutch mechanism so that the geared motor is always engaged, whether you're coasting, pedaling, or applying power. This does mean you will notice a little bit of resistance if you try to pedal this bike without power. It's minor, but noticeable. However, if that's a sacrifice that has to be made to get regenerative braking to work, I could accept that. Unfortunately, the regen braking on this bike doesn't work like you think it would. Admittedly, I was really excited to hear that this bike had this feature, but then disappointed when I tried to use it. I expected the regen braking to activate when I pull the brake levers, as it does on scooters and direct drive bikes. But unfortunately, it completely ignores the brakes altogether, and only works when you're in the lowest pedal assist mode or when pedal assist is turned off. And when you couple that configuration with the fact that the regen only activates when you're above 12 miles an hour and not applying power, well, I wasn't able to use it at all in any practical situations during my entire two weeks of testing. If you were to go down a long hill, you would have to consciously remember to put the bike in zero pedal assist or level one to get any regen to the battery. So, Ingwe, if you're listening, maybe on future models you could set this bike up so that when you press the brake levers, it activates the regen. That would be a lot more useful in many situations. The rear taillight, like on most e-bikes, is pretty bright and good for safety. Unfortunately, the headlight's pretty dim. Now, this is in wet conditions, so it makes it look worse than it is, but even in dry conditions, this is one of the dimmest ones I've tested so far. As mentioned earlier, these fenders do a really good job at keeping you dry and mud free. They're also mounted very securely to the frame and the mounting points are reinforced, so I have no safety concerns. But because they're aluminum, if you're riding in bumpy conditions like here, they can make a little bit of noise from time to time, as the chain will bounce off the rear fender when you're in the first two gears. This is a small nitpick and not going to affect most of you riding in smooth conditions, but it is one reason why I prefer to have plastic fenders whenever possible. One other issue I did run into for the first couple of rides, there was a loud rattle coming from the rear fender and it was just because it was mounted a little too close to the frame. So I loosened this bolt and backed it off just a hair. There may be some advanced features and settings in their heads-up display that I can't find yet. The PDF file on their website's still for the old display. This is a new upgraded version, so we'll just have to wait and see. I did, however, find this pretty intuitive. You simply hold down the plus and minus button and it enters the menu. Everything's spelled out, you don't need to memorize P settings, and you can make all sorts of custom changes. This includes adding or removing pedal assist levels, customizing each level, setting the automatic headlight on and off, setting the cruise control on and off, increasing your maximum speed limit, changing it from miles per hour to kilometers per hour, all the basic stuff that you really need. When you hit the I button while you're riding the bike, you can toggle between distance, time of your ride, or my favorite, how many watts you're using. This is incredibly useful and just nice to see. There's only two things missing that would have made it perfect for me, and that's a voltage readout and or the ability to customize your percentage-based battery bar indicator just to make sure it's accurate. I'm pretty sure it's not calibrated to compensate for lithium ion batteries, but it does seem pretty close. But I did take it for an 18 mile ride on gravel roads where I put it in eco mode that limits it to 500 watts and used pretty much all throttle for the entire trip. I did pedal a few times when it was going up slight hills just to help extend my range a little bit, but the bike did most of the work. When I returned home after the 18 mile trip, the battery bar indicator said it had 60% left under load. Now with as accurate as these things are, I don't know how much was really left in the battery, but based off of past experience, this bike would do 25 miles in eco mode, no problems. And this is nice because with that 500 watt limit, 
I was still able to easily hit 20 miles an hour on flat ground, which is pretty good considering what you get out of most eco modes on other bikes. So far for what this bike has in its price bracket, it's really impressive in my opinion. I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel here trying to find anything that could be improved as that's what I really enjoy about these videos the most is hopefully the manufacturers are listening and they can make these small improvements. But they've done a pretty good job so far and I only have a couple more things that I'd like to point out. The automatic lighting feature is pretty convenient. I have to say I like it. Unfortunately, it's got one small problem. You can't manually turn on the lights when it's in automatic mode. And this is kind of unfortunate because if you're riding in an overcast situation where you would want to have your lights on, but there's still enough light to keep them from turning on, you can't manually turn them on. You can push this button as many times as you want, and it'll just keep turning them off. Not a big deal because you can turn this feature off in the settings and just use your manual headlights as you would on pretty much every other bike. So maybe they could fix it so that if you push the button when it's in auto mode, the lights will stay on. The heads up display does have a USB charging port, which is great. Charge your phone, camera, extra batteries, a headlight to upgrade the one on the bike, or just a myriad of accessories. Sometimes I like to put LED strips on my bikes, especially when it's close to the holidays. I assume it's just a slow charger at one amp. Hopefully they'll start putting fast chargers on these bikes in the future, but I'm happy that it's there. Let's go ahead and move on to comfort because that's important to some people. Well, this bike has almost everything. If the seat was a little more comfy and there was a suspension seat post, it would be the maximum level of comfort that you can get, but you know, they can only go so far. And what they've done is enough, in my opinion. You've got the fat tires. They do a lot for pretty much any bike. And you have full suspension with at least hydraulic in the front, which does even more. But then this bike is unique in one way which I wish I would have realized a long time ago. You notice this bike has tiny little handlebars. Now, the seat on the bike is not uncomfortable. However, it's not the best, so, you know, after about an hour, you're probably going to want to take a break. Or, you can just stand up and treat it like a scooter. Yes, I know that might sound bizarre, or some of you are like, duh, you can do that. But, okay, I never realized this until now, but on these folding fat tire bikes with the short little handlebars, and the extendable stems, they're really easy to stand up on. And I'm six foot four, so if you're short, I can imagine this would be a lot easier. So, yeah, at some point during my ride, and I have no idea why, I just stood up, and for some reason it was really easy to do and control the bike. So there's that. If you need to get some pressure off your behind for a minute or two, just stand up. It, it feels like you're riding a scooter. It's great. And these are metal pedals, so I'm not really too worried about them, you know, breaking. But I wouldn't recommend doing this in sketchy situations. You know, smooth roads probably the best. And I'm not here saying that it's a safe way to ride. But with some practice, you can probably get away with it. As for the handlebars being really short, I think they did this by choice, not to cut costs. It's a folding bike, and instead of going with fold-down handlebars, they just decided to use short handlebars, which doesn't bother me at all. However, because they're so short, it pretty much forced them to put the throttle on the left side of the bike so they could keep the shifter on the right side. Now, you could probably get the throttle on the right side of the handlebars if you have large hands like I do. I can reach these levers, I have more than enough pull, so I could probably move them over just a little bit. But yeah, that's why they put the throttle on the left side of the bike. Now, this doesn't bother me at all. I got on the bike, immediately said, oh, the throttle's on the left, and then rode the bike, and never gave it a second thought. But, my girlfriend does not like the throttle on the left. As a matter of fact, she outright hates it. I don't know if it's just a normal C bias thing, you know, throttles are always on the right. This is probably going to infuriate some people for some reason. I could care less. But if you put a throttle on the left side of a gas bike, we're going to have to have some words. Show you guys these brakes real quick right here. 22 miles an hour. These hydraulic brakes are nice. 
I'm just trying to control it so I don't skid. I hate skidding tires. <laughs> My OCD goes nuts. But uh, yeah, these these brakes are awesome. Yeah. You know, all I can say about the hydraulic brakes on the Engine Pro is good job and thank you. Not only do they do their job very well in dry and wet conditions, but I don't have to constantly keep readjusting them after every week of riding. I would like to point out to anybody who doesn't have a lot of experience with hydraulic brakes, if you get this bike, take it easy at first and get a good feel for these brakes. They're a lot more sensitive than mechanicals, and if you just squeeze them in a panic stop, not used to what they can do, you might go over the handlebars, as these can lock up both tires. That's not a complaint. I'm not at all complaining about their performance. I'm just informing you that you want to get used to them before you squeeze them too hard. They stomp the bike with no issues very quickly, and if you squeeze them too hard, you will lock up both tires, so be careful. Out of the box, the calipers were already adjusted, and the brake pads were not rubbing. And because they're hydraulic brakes and they were adjusted from the factory, that means you're not really going to have to touch them at all until it's time to replace the actual pads themselves. With mechanical brakes, after every couple of rides, you're usually adjusting and tightening, messing with the cables, all that annoying stuff. Not the end of the world, just annoying. So yeah, from me, big thumbs up on putting hydraulics on the bike. They're great. As for the hydraulic forks, I assume they're just a budget brand of hydraulic forks, better than the cheap stuff, not high end or anything like that. But for what it's worth, after riding through all this muck, grime, and wet conditions, after two weeks, they feel just as smooth as they did when they came out of the box. Big bonus there, good job on the seals. As mentioned many times before in past videos, I don't go out of my way to abuse and misuse these bikes. I just ride them how I normally ride my gas bikes. And because of that, they're subjected to conditions which most people would probably not consider riding through, or at the very least, most people would ride through a lot more carefully. So, even though most of you are probably never going to get your bikes this dirty, I kind of feel obligated to show you the worst case scenario. If my bike can survive this, yours will probably survive leisurely riding. With that being said, I would like to point out that mud, muck, and grime gets flicked all over the rear suspension and the keyed ignition. This bike will not function unless the key is in and in the on position. Now, the key does lock into the bike, so I'm not too worried about it just falling out, but mud might make its way into the keyway and cause issues in the future. Without a complete redesign of the battery and bike, I'm not sure what they could do to help fix this issue, but personally, I prefer to have a keyed ignition on my bikes, so I would rather it be there than not be anywhere. Now, the bike itself doesn't claim to have any water-resistant rating, but you guys know me. If they're going to send me a bike, I'm going to ride it in the rain, in the mud. That's real-world conditions. The battery, on the other hand, does say on their website that it is a waterproof battery or water resistant something like that I saw it somewhere on the website um, still I decided to go ahead and use Gorilla Tape to cover up as much of this keyway as possible just to keep all the mud from getting inside the keyway and making it pretty much impossible to use in the future it's ugly but it's on the bottom of the bike so you're never gonna see it do I think you need to do this well no not unless you plan on riding the bikes like I do okay on to power now the upgraded engine has a 16 amp hour battery. I believe their original only had a 12 amp hour battery. Unfortunate for anybody who bought that version, I feel for you. That's not a lot of range and that's probably a lot of voltage sag. The heads up display offers three power modes. This is not the pedal assist modes, this is something different. It limits the amount of power given to the motor. An eco mode, that's 500 watts. It will go all the way up to the bike's top speed if you let it, which is 28 miles an hour, but it's only gonna do it with 500 watts. Normal mode will give you 750 watts, and more on that in a moment. And then there's Sport mode, which will run all the way to 1,000 watts. The display reads 999, but it's 1,000 watts. However, Sport mode appears to stay at 1,000 watts continuously, not peak, which would make this a 1,000 watt e-bike if the display is reading correctly, and I have no reason to think that it's not, because the acceleration on this bike in sport mode appears to be the fastest out of all my e-bikes so far. And I'm not saying it's blazing fast or super awesome, it just feels stronger than all of my other bikes. So here's a quick demo pull in sport mode of its acceleration 
from zero to top speed. So, let me sum up my first impressions of the Engine Pro from Ingwe. I've tested a handful of bikes and have a handful more to test in the $15 to $1600 price range, and so far this one has the most high-end features, relatively speaking, compared to all the other bikes. The bike still has a long way to go before it proves itself worth the price, but if it holds up in the long run under these conditions, I couldn't imagine it would fail on anyone else. Only time will tell, so we'll just have to see how that goes. Small nitpicks aside, the only real complaint I have about this bike is just the regen braking not really being set up for most practical situations. Like I said, if they would just make it so that when you squeeze the brake lever it activates, then it would be great. And I wouldn't really have much to complain about on this bike, other than the tiny little things which really don't affect me that much. And you guys know I don't sugarcoat these reviews. I don't make any money off of these bikes, whether they sell or not. They simply give me the bike for a review, and I show you guys what I think. With that being said, no other bikes in this price bracket that I've tested have as many features as you get on the Engine Pro. So I can happily recommend this as a good sweet spot bike in its price range. As far as what sacrifice they probably made to get the price down with all these features is I didn't notice any mention of them using high quality Samsung or LG cells in the bike, which is probably where they help keep the cost down. I'm not making any claims that it's a low quality battery, it's just that when they use these high quality cells they usually mention it on the website, as it's quite a high selling feature. So I hope you guys got some useful information out of this video, or at the very least, were mildly entertained. And until next time, ride safe.